Hi, my name is Adam Gross, director of The Lapis Press. Today I'd like to introduce to you a project that was very special and near and dear to us, and one which captured a absolutely integral, if completely unknown, component of Los Angeles's art history. In 1975, an artist by the name of Stephen Shore took a road trip across the United States, and a road trip that was one that had a, a really outsized influence on contemporary art. And the reason for that was that throughout that road trip, he was shooting and took photos in color, which first of all, we have to remember that color photography in the early and mid 70s and prior to that was considered solely the purview of commerce. It was for advertising, um, it was for editorial, but it would never ever be used by a serious photographer. In 1972, William Eggleston had the first museum show of color photography ever in the United States at MoMA. No small feat. The art world really didn't know how to understand color photography, and not, not just color photography, but the kind of photography that Stephen was taking, that Eggleston was taking. This was color photography that was shooting not just the beautiful landscape, but it was also shooting things like the interior of an oven. It was shooting landscapes that were not the prototypical pretty landscapes. This was about um, really challenging the way that you were looking at photography, not just via color, but via composition. As Stephen gets to the end of his trip, which ends him up in Los Angeles, he takes a photo which gets ultimately published, um, but what we end up finding through a bit of research and through working with some uh, wonderful partners, we get a better understanding of how impactful this photo was because it's far more than just a photo that was taken on June 21st, 1975 on the corner of Beverly and La Brea in Los Angeles. Well, the backstory really begins, you know, in 1972 at MoMA, our story, for the purposes of, of this project, really begins on June 21st, 1975. And that's when Stephen arrives in Los Angeles and comes to the corner of Beverly and La Brea. From what I understand, the reason he was really attracted to that intersection was the fact that there are gas stations on all four corners, which for somebody not from the West or from Los Angeles or from California, it seems like the oddest thing in the world. So he sets up his eight by 10 camera and he captures the shot. You know, he lays there in bed that night and is thinking to himself and realizes that he's not interested necessarily in the perfectly composed photo. What he's interested in is the photo, the image that's going to challenge the viewer, challenge their definition of landscape. You know, he wakes up the next morning and thinks to himself, God, I, I need to, I need to fix that shot, I need to go back. The next day, so June 22nd, 1975, he takes a photo of the intersection. And now you can see he's standing in the same spot, but all he's done here is he has turned his camera about maybe 40 degrees. In this shot, you have the cars driving off frame. You have much more visual noise. You can also see it's not even as clear a day. I mean, there's a hint of the Santa Monica Mountains in the background, but they're completely obscured by haze. There's the wires in the background, the, the billboards. Um, it's, a, it's ultimately a much more challenging image. Interestingly enough, was exactly what Stephen was looking for. So June 21st, perfectly composed, classically composed. June 22nd, a much more challenging image. Stephen Shore, in 1975, publishes a book called Uncommon Places. Just as Eggleston's Guide in 1972 at MoMA sent ripples through the art world, so did Stephen Shore's Uncommon Places. And photography books are an interesting component of the art world because it's photography and reproducing photographs in print, there's a real equivalency there. And in addition to that, the reason this book is so influential is because it is a book. An exhibition lives for a few months, it goes down. This is a book that is being published, it's being widely distributed, widely looked at, and it's filled with these challenging images. So, unbeknownst to Stephen, one of the people who view this book are Berend and Hilda Becker. Berend and Hilda Becker are extremely important conceptual photographers. They work exclusively in black and white, silver gelatin. And where they were at that time was in Dusseldorf, teaching at the Kunst Academy there. You know, when you're thinking of conceptual photography, when you're thinking of 
typologies and when you're thinking of black and white, you could really do no better. They're going through Stephen Shore's book and they come across this image. So they contact Stephen and the request was, hey, we, we'd like to do an exchange of, uh, of images with you. You know, so you send us a print or two, we send you a print or two, which you have to remember at that point, if these prints were a couple hundred dollars a piece, then that would be a, a lot of money in the late 70s. Um, so they do the exchange. What ends up happening is that very same year, as they're teaching, you know, the, the class comes into the studio and they're giving them the introduction and, and they get to the point where they say, listen, now there's color photography, which you know, we know is happening out there, but we're really, we're Barrington Hilda Becker. We're, we're not known for color photography. We have no experience in it. We really have no right to be teaching you color photography in the way that, that other people might be able to. Please look at this photo because you can begin and end here because this is a perfect example of a beautiful composition in color photography. What really makes this interesting and what, what really pricked up our ears was the fact that three of the photographers in that first class that are being introduced to this photo by Stephen Shore are three photographers which end up having a really outsized influence on not just photography and not just color photography, but contemporary art and how we interact and interface with contemporary art. Those three artists, Candida Hoffer, Thomas Struth and Andrea Skursky. Now, if you're familiar with these artists, you'll understand that, that these are photographers that take color photography from eight by 10 inches to eight by 10 feet, from $10,000 in the day sale for photography to over a million dollars in the contemporary art evening sale. These are photographers that literally through the force of their vision, through the, 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 through the expansiveness of their vision, through their ability to make large eight by 10 foot, six by eight foot prints, and to provide you an opportunity to experience them almost like you would experience a billboard or a large mural or a Jackson Pollock painting or a Rothko. In a way, if you think of color photography today, you think of any artist that is using large format color photography, you can trace that back to Candida Hoffer, Thomas Struth, and Andreas Gursky, which then gets traced back to the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf in the late 70s, which then gets traced back to the Beckers, which then goes back to Stephen Shore in Uncommon Places, which ultimately brings you back to the intersection of Beverly and La Brea in Los Angeles. So in this case, this is Stephen Shore at Beverly and La Brea, but the idea was, was that the intersection of Beverly and La Brea will stand as a point of focus for a larger matrix, which is an art historical matrix, it's a photographic matrix, it's a literal metaphor for the, the matrix, which is Los Angeles, this endless gridded street. And you know anyone that's been on Mulholland or flown into LA at night understands how impressive that view is, how almost overwhelming it is, because the city seems to go on forever. So the idea was if those images affect a generation of German artists, which influence a generation of artists and photographers globally, then what happens 30 years later, 40 years later, when we invite a series of younger emerging photographers in this case, and artists from Germany to come to Los Angeles and to document the city? this idea of inviting six different artists in over a period of time and share with them the story, share with them these images and ask the question, what does Los Angeles look like to you now, 30 years later, 40 years later? One of the artists that we brought out, which we were particularly pleased with, is an artist by the name of Robert Voigt. Now, Robert came out to Los Angeles and became very surprised with the fact that LA is ultimately, or started at least, as an oil and gas town. So this is a photo of uh, the Baldwin Hills and a, as you can see, a, uh, an oil well that's framed in the background. The largest urban oil field in the world is less than a mile from where I'm standing right now in Baldwin Hills. So what he was struck by was this oil and gas infrastructure, which, you know, if you know Los Angeles, you might know that there is an oil well on Beverly Hills High School campus. There's an oil well between Cedar sinai and the Beverly Center.
the next artist that we invited out was a gentleman by the name of Max Regenberg, but was somebody who, from the beginning of his career as a photographer and as an artist, was very interested in large-scale advertisements and billboards, um, which in Germany you don't get a lot of. In Los Angeles, however, you get a lot of. So in this case, uh, he came to Los Angeles and was looking for places where large-scale billboards, or I think they're called mega graphics now. Some are billboards, others are, in this case, a mural. This is on you know, the corner of Sunset Boulevard near Laurel Canyon, um, a place that pretty much everybody in Los Angeles knows. Pico and La Cienega, a completely nondescript, unremarkable um, intersection in Los Angeles, which suddenly in the hands of Max Regenberg looks quite beautiful. Jens is almost like a, um, approaches his subjects and his ideas almost anthropologically. And in this case, he asked himself the question, how do Angelinos see their city? What he did was he took a series of photos. These are completely candid shots of uh, distinct locations in and around Los Angeles, or really in Los Angeles. Um, what's interesting about this is the fact that in, I think, every one of these photos, a rear view mirror is featured which is also interesting because that is literally one of the signature elements of a photographer named Lee Friedlander, who also has done a lot of photography um, and is quite renowned in Los Angeles. So this was the corner of uh, Wilshire and La Brea, which now looks completely different, as does most of Los Angeles. So each photographer was afforded five images to put into this portfolio. We came up with this idea of using uh, these you know, archival inkjet sleeves, this was all produced digitally, and packaging them in something which is really more akin to a book. You can have this on your, on your coffee table, on your bookshelf, um, and really anybody can pull these images out, look at them without gloves. And this slipcase is beautifully embossed with a relief image in leather, in this case white leather, of Stephen Shore's Beverly and La Brea. That shot that on June 21st, June 22nd, 1975, in a way changed the course of contemporary art history. Mm -hmm. 